podcast. My name is Wendy Hummel. Today you're going to hear a conversation that I had with Sherry Martin, the National FOP Wellness Coordinator. I was fortunate enough to meet Sherry in 2020 after our agency was matched with her and two other subject matter experts from the Nashville Police Department. As our agency launched our wellness initiative and peer support program, I applied through a program called CRITAC, Collaborative Reform Initiative Technical Assistance Center. CRITAC paired our agency with Sherry and the two guys from Nashville, and her background as a law enforcement veteran and clinician were extremely valuable as we move forward with our program. Sherry shared insight, guidance, and some of the initiatives that the FOP and the COPS office were working on at the time, which helped tremendously in the launch of our wellness and peer support programs, one of which is the vetting guide, which we will talk about in our conversation coming up. The day that I spoke with Sherry, which was March 8th of this year, was coincidentally International Women's Day, a day that celebrates women's achievements and a reminder that progress still needs to be made. Sherry and I cover a lot of territory in this conversation. We start with her law enforcement career in Charleston, South Carolina, and Enfield, Connecticut, and how she ultimately landed in her current position as the Director of Wellness Services with the FOP. Besides our shared passion for law enforcement wellness, Sherry and I have a few other things in common. We talk about falling in love. Yes, I said falling in love with our husbands and how we move cross country to be with them, relocating and starting over in our careers and what it's like to work in a male dominated profession. The percentage of women in law enforcement isn't much different than it was 25 years ago. About 12 to 14% of women are currently in the law enforcement profession and it wasn't much different back then. This is why it's so important for women to support other women in this field. I asked Sherry to share a female role model or two, or a friend that she's grateful for in the spirit of this International Women's Day. Sherry's answer made me reflect on all of the brave and wonderful women that I've worked with over the years, and those that I work with today. There are too many to name, but if you're listening, you should know who you are. We dive into the National FOP's third wellness conference that was held this past January in Nashville. I was fortunate enough to attend with several other members from my agency, and it was a great event. Sherry and I talk highlights from Nashville and what's on the horizon for the FOP. Sherry is a trailblazer in her field, and I am so grateful to have met her. I had a lot of fun talking with her, and it was kind of like chatting with an old friend. Let me know what you think, and I really hope you enjoy this episode. Today, I'm going to be talking to Sherry Martin. She's the National FOP Wellness Coordinator, and I'm very excited to have you on, Sherry. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Wendy. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, this has been something I've been wanting to happen for a while now, so I'm glad we got it figured out. Awesome. Me too. Me too. So we were chatting a little bit before I hit record, and you are the National FOP Wellness Coordinator, That's right. and you've been doing that for a few years, and I definitely want to talk to you about that, but I just want to kind of quickly or not maybe so quickly have you just tell everybody all the listeners who aren't familiar with you um a little bit about your career because you've been in law enforcement for quite a while um and if you're comfortable talking about what agencies or what part of the country you worked for and kind of what landed you to be in the position that you are today absolutely so well it's been it seemed if i look back it seems like it's been a long road but it really went by very fast you know if i think about 20 years ago 20 years went by in the blink of an eye but um so yeah so i um i grew up as a military kid so i moved around the country quite a bit when i was uh growing up but after uh college in north carolina i went to the university of north carolina for school and really didn't know what i wanted to do with my life and i thought that i wanted to be a judge uh, and then hmm. I thought, well, I really don't want to go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, well, maybe I'll major in psychology because that sounds interesting, you know. So we're back in the days now of Clarice Starling, and that mm -hmm. looked like a cool job to do. So I majored in psychology, 
But then when I got to the end of college, decided that I had enough of school and didn't want to keep going to graduate school at the time. So I was like, well, I guess I should go get a job. And I had been an intern at the Chapel Hill Police Department. Um, we, that was a small police department, and they had one uh, guy who did forensics, and he was more like crime scene type of thing. Um, but, you know, that was as close to forensics as I could get. So I had worked there as an intern and thought, well, I'll just go. I can go get a job at the police department. And I did. So I started uh, at Chapel Hill Police Department in North Carolina. And after working there for about a year, uh, my brother was living in Charleston, South Carolina at the time. He was in the military and had gotten out of the military in Charleston, was working as a paramedic in Charleston. And he said, you know, you really should come here. This is a great place. And so off I went to Charleston, South Carolina, to a bigger department. Um, and so um, during my career at Charleston, I was there for almost 18 years. And I spent most of it in patrol, and I learned that that's where I wanted to be. I had some other assignments. After about two years in patrol, I went to an assignment as a warrants investigator. And what that meant is that I chased down wanted people, um, you know, to answer to their warrants. And I really, uh, even though, it, you know, it's everyone considered that to be kind of a cushy job, I, I uh, because it was Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, um, I didn't enjoy the work because I, I I have a very short attention span. So it was hard for me to stay connected to an investigation and spend months and weeks chasing down people. So um, I stayed in that assignment and then promoted out of that assignment uh, to back to the road at, as a first line supervisor. And I stayed there um, for the, for basically the rest of my career, uh, eventually promoted to sergeant, um, became a supervisor of a special unit for a while um, aggressive policing type of things where, you know, we attacked problems and, and set up, uh, set up plans to tackle problems in the community and then executed those plans. And eventually I, uh, was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant where I was an evening shift watch commander. And the way that things worked at Charleston police department is, uh, most of our command staff. So captains, lieutenants, chiefs, deputy chiefs, uh, it was an agency of about 450 sworn at the time I was there. And most of our command staff worked during the day. So as the evening shift watch commander, I was the highest ranking person working. And so I was in charge of all of the special units, all of the bits and pieces of the department all working together, um, you know, and sometimes that was as many as 150 employees at a time. So it was, uh, it, that was exciting to me. What, However, um, one thing that, that happened during all of that is that I went back to school. Uh, because somewhere along in the rank of sergeant, I said, you know, I'm not sure that I, my body's going to take this job forever. And I'm not sure this is really isn't really what I intended to do with my life, even though I enjoyed police work. Once I got into the profession, I thought, you know, I probably I really ought to go back to school. And I mentioned my short attention span, you know, somewhere along the way, I thought, well, I, I need to be doing something else. You know, I need more to enrich me than, you know, what I'm doing going. We all hit that somewhere in that, you know, 10 to 15 year period where you just need something more. So I went back to school, went to the Citadel uh, there in Charleston or my master's degree in counseling. And so I had that under my belt as well. And then after I finished uh, my degree, I stayed on. I was working as an intern at the VA hospital there in Charleston because I liked doing therapy work for our veterans and helping those that had PTSD and di depression diagnoses. I enjoyed that work. And then uh, what came along next is uh, I fell in love and moved to Connecticut. So... Um, I, when I moved to Connecticut, I went back to uh, the bottom of the ranks and started over in patrol. And, you know, Wendy, at the time, I was like, whoo, man, what a relief. Because all of that uh, responsibility that I had as a lieutenant and as a watch commander, I, I missed doing the work of being a police officer. And so it was actually quite fun to go back to patrol uh, in, in Enfield, Connecticut, where uh, is the last agency I worked at. So Enfield uh, is an agency of about 90 sworn. And, um, you know, I worked at that agency for I think, four and a half years. And then, um, as, as I do, I start to get bored with that short attention span and back to school. I went again and, uh, went and earned a postgraduate certificate in forensic psychology at John Jay college in New York city. And so in, in Connecticut where I live now, we're only about two hours from New York city. So I would commute to New York and go to class, uh, for that postgraduate certificate. 
And then when I finished that, some things started to happen in the FOP. I'd been a member of the FOP since way back early in my career, somewhere around uh, 1999, I think I joined the FOP. And um, very quickly learned that it was an organization that I believed in. You know, our mission as uh, the uh, as the FOP is to improve the lives and working conditions of police officers. So we started as an organization that was primarily labor advocacy. Uh, and then that, you know, became labor, uh, not only just labor, but legal defense. And then we went even further. We do a lot of work now legislatively to try to impact laws that affect the lives and working conditions of the police. And so within the national FOP, we have something like 18 committees that work on all things that are related to a law enforcement officer's life, whether it's, you know, border security or safety equipment or, you know, pensions or, you know, um, all kinds of things. And we had an officer wellness committee. And so the people that work on these committees do so as volunteers. They're all working cops or either active or retired police officers. We're a member-run organization. And so they do that work on the committees, and they're basically their free time. Um, and so I was nominated to be on the Officer Wellness Committee. Soon after, we got, soon after I got on that committee, um, we had an opportunity to do some survey research with our membership. We had a relationship with NBC News 4 in New York, and, you know, they said, we listen, we really want to do some stories about the human side of first responder life. They had done some with a fire service, and so they came to us, and they said, we really want to, you know, see if we can survey your members and find out, you know, get some information so that we can do some stories on what the human side of law enforcement is. So we obviously, on the Officer Wellness Committee, thought it was a great idea because we'd get a chance to tell um you know, the, the things that we already know as law enforcement officers a long time are, are going on with wellness. So that turned out to be a much bigger, um, much bigger thing than we thought, because the level of response that we got to that initial survey told us that mental health and wellness was a huge, a huge topic for law enforcement. And from that, um, we started to develop some some wellness programs within the FOP that we had never had before. And we acquired some funding to be able to build those programs. And it necessitated us having someone doing the work full time. And so, you know, I feel very lucky that between 23 years as a law enforcement officer, training as a clinical therapist, and my love for the organization that I work for landed me in the position of director of wellness services. And you know, I, I really couldn't be more grateful. So that's kind of my story and where it all started and how I got here. <laughs> wow. That's all I could say in the first few minutes. Like you, you've said so much that like my head's spinning. I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to ask her so many questions. <laughs> um, but, but the first thing I want to go back to is uh, you're talking about your career and how, you know, you got to do a lot of different things and, and it seems like you had a lot of success, which is awesome. And then you talk about you fell in love and you moved and you, you started all over again. And I want, that's kind of where I'm headed is that um, you're a woman in law enforcement and there's not, there have never really been that many of us back when you and I probably started very close to the same time, yeah. what, 12 to 14%. And then now it's really not that much different. You would think that it would be higher, but it's not. And so I, what you said really struck a chord because I did the same thing. I, um, I, I'm I from the East Coast originally, from New York and New Jersey. So when you said John Jay, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so jealous. That's where I wanted to go to graduate school, but I ended up going somewhere else. Um, but I moved. I started as a federal agent in New York City. With Back then it was INS, and now it's Dep Department of Homeland Security. But I met my husband in the academy in Glencoe, Georgia, and he was working in Wichita, Kansas. And so... I moved after two years of this long distance relationship. I didn't, I wasn't in love with my job maybe as much and it was earlier on and I had always wanted to be a street cop. Most like I really wanted to be a detective. Yeah. So it wasn't a hard decision, but it was still a pretty big decision to give that up and move across to the Midwest. Like when you're yeah. thinking about Kansas from New York, it's quite the, the culture shock. So you saying you left for love, I could totally relate. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it is a big change to move like that i mean yeah like i said i moved around the country growing up mm -hmm. but i spent i had spent most of my adult life in the southeast and so um you know and i, I used to joke all the time that i would either marry someone from new york city or I, because i love new york city mm -hmm. or i would marry someone from texas and i got pretty close my husband's born and raised in connecticut so it's that's pretty close 
But yeah, so, you know, and all my friends that know me know that I love warm weather and I love the beach. And, you know, they were like, yeah, you're not going to make it six months in New England. But six years later, plus here I still am. So. Yes, yes. And it is a beautiful part of the country, though, because we still have a lot of family in Connecticut and Maine. And and so it is really nice. But let I just want to ask you just, just briefly um, about what it's like or what it was like to be a female cop, because it is a little bit unique. Um, is there anything that stands out to you about that experience? Yeah. You know, what's funny, Wendy, is I think that, you know, talking about the time that we came on, I feel like since, since that time back in the late nineties, um, to now law enforcement as a profession has changed dramatically. Um, the way that we do our jobs, the level of education that most officers have, the technology that we have, um, just the way that we, we have learned to interact with the public is completely different. And um, I feel like I sort of straddled between the old school, if you will, and the new school because I was still a working cop, you know, three years ago on the road. So I feel like I kind of watched the transition happen. And, you know, (laughs) when I first started, I think uh, in that first agency, Chapel Hill, I think there were three or four of us female officers in an oh, wow. agency of a hundred. So even smaller percentage than, you know, than then. And, um, you know, I feel like, I feel like for the most part, um, I got a fair shake, um, you know, but I think a lot of it's just your own perspective. You know, there were times that I felt like, um, I had to fight harder because at least, you know, within the agency and politics, because I was female, there were times when I felt like I actually had an advantage because I was considered a minority. Um, and so, you know, if, if we're being truthful about it, um, uh, and I feel like those experiences, so, you know, things I, I laugh now because I hear stories about, um, you know, anecdotally about things that women go through being in a male dominated culture. And most of those things I laughed off earlier in my career. You know, I wasn't offended. I knew kind of felt like I knew what I was getting myself into having grown up in a military family. Um, I felt like I kind of knew, you know, not to excuse any of the things that the guys did that were rough around us ladies back then. Um, but I, you know, I felt like, well, you knew what you were getting yourself into. Um, you know, and I I think that, I think that I feel lucky because I feel like we were in a time that we were part of the change happening, uh, and the way women are looked at in law enforcement. Um, you know, there's still always going to be some of that good old boy, you know, um, boys club thing going on. But, you know, for example, the last agency I worked at in Enfield, Connecticut, We had, in an agency of 90, we had uh, at one time nine, eight or nine women working, I think now they may be up to 10 working at that agency now. And so that was a much larger percentage. You know, there was a good number of women working there and a very strong support system. I think that one thing that happened with women in law enforcement is early on there were so few of us and and struggling to... um, survive that we oftentimes didn't work together as women. And I feel like now women are working together more um, to build each other up and to support each other, um, which is great. You know, I'm glad to see that happening. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that um, because that's something I was going to ask you about too. But, but I agree, like for the most part, my experience was pretty similar to yours. Um, I felt like I have a a pretty thick skin. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, when I look back, maybe now, um, some of those things I wouldn't have put up with necessarily, (laughs) but for the most part, like I just really wanted to be there and do the the job. Like that's really why I was there. And I felt so lucky because it was my, for me personally, I'm one of those people who I knew at the age of 12, like I wanted to be a cop. I wanted to be a detective. Like that was my dream. And I was just so happy to be there. And I have to say, you know, yes, there were some few people, there was a few people that I can look back on and identify they were the assholes. Sorry, I'm just going to say it. I don't know how else to describe it. You're not wrong. <laughs> but but overall, like I have, I was talking to you a little bit before we, we recorded that I still have like such good friends, like oh, yeah. brothers. I have such an extended brotherhood yeah. um, and sisterhood too, though, but so many good people like and any of the supervisors and the partners that I've had that were men for the most part treated me fairly respectfully. And, you know, we're part of each other's lives as friends, even now. And my husband, you know, I've always been 
uh, as long as I've been with that, with my prior agency, I've always been married or with my husband. And so he's always been a part of that too. So it's been kind of nice because I don't know if it, if it changes dynamics when you're a single female and you're in the profession yeah. for me, I didn't have to deal with that. So I just, I'd always been with my husband and it was always just friendships, partnerships and, and just respect, mutual respect. So I, and I, I agree with you too. Maybe sometimes there were some advantages, um, I always, I, I was always very careful to try to make sure that I earned and worked yeah. harder yeah. because I didn't want it to appear that I was given certain things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it helped me. My head was hard. Still is, always will be, I guess, you know, so if somebody gave me a hard time, I just, you know, worked that much harder to earn things and, and uh, prove that I was w worthy of being there. Um, so, you know, I think in a way, you know, maybe some of that stuff makes us stronger. Um, you know, I look back now and some, some of my favorite memories of, of the job or some of my early training officers and how hard they were on me. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, in a, in a way, I'm grateful for that. I mean, at the time, I thought it was just terrible. You know, I'd never be treated this way if I was a guy. But I, I think I look back on it now and I'm grateful because I think it made me a better police officer. It made me stronger and made me understand the culture a lot better. And, um, you know, in the end, and, you know, it didn't, it didn't affect me at all in the end. Yeah. And, and I want to talk to you about the other women that you work with, cause you brought it up. Um, and again, I, I had, you, you described it, uh, similarly to what I experienced for the most part. And again, there were one or two that we referred to as the queen bees or the queen bee syndrome. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> See, I know when I say that people know what I'm talking about because you've experienced it, but for the most part, like, I feel like there, that's another unique little group that I've connected with. And I know that, you know, we're supposed to have all these friends outside of law enforcement that don't do your job, but I, all of my, most of my good female friends to this day are people I've met as a result oh, yeah. of, of being a cop because not only do we have work in common but you know we're mostly you know moms sisters wives and we go we do jewelry parties and we do yoga I mean we talk about work but it's just unique because it it brought us together it's not what keeps our friendship solid but but anyhow I just didn't know um how that how that was for you coming up? Yeah, I, t I think my experience is similar. So um, my best friend is another police officer, and she I met her many years ago at the first agency in Chapel Hill. And, um, you know, I, I was going through some field training struggles and, you know, feeling a little bit um, like I maybe I wasn't going to make it. And she really uh, supported me and got me through those hard times. And then that friendship just remained um, you know, she's still my best friend 20 years later, you know, but I have other friends who also are in law enforcement, whether I work with them or not. In fact, my probably my closest friend here in Connecticut, I've never worked with her, but she's also a police officer. You just kind of, you know, you understand where each other's coming from. Um, you can understand the experiences because let's face it, when you're in law enforcement, it takes over a lot of your life. Um, you know, whether it's because, you know, the schedule you're working and, you know, it's just so it's hard to sometimes maintain friendships outside of that if you're working shift work and you know other friends aren't and so we have a lot of the same experiences if you're you know talking to another woman that's in law enforcement so there's an, a common understanding that you don't even have to explain um because you already understand it so you know if i look to the people who inspired me along the way it's people like my best friend you know way back then who she had she saw me going through some of the things she went through and you know she she helped me up um so to speak and and conti has continued to over my entire life so um you know i guess that's what real friends do yeah and i'm and i'm glad you you mentioned that because i did tell you i wanted to ask you because it is women's history month and today Yay. The day you and I are talking on March 8th, um, it's International Women's Day. And so oh. I warned you that I was going to ask you like, <laughs> to think of like a woman or anybody who stood out that inspired you or has impacted you in some way. And obviously you've got your friend that you... Yeah. Yeah. She's and she now is a federal agent. She, um, you know, kept going on her way and, you know, made her way in the world, too. She's also now a mom. You know, at the time we were both single women, single women um, working in the men's world of, of that police agency. Um, you know, but she married a man actually outside of law enforcement. Um, she's a mom and um, still working, you know, full time as a federal agent. So, yeah, you know, her her strength um, and just her wisdom. 
I think really inspired me. It's, you know, certainly, uh, I think we all look to our mothers as, you know, inspiration and things. My mom's always been, uh, a, I say my biggest cheerleader because, you know, at the times when I have ever doubted myself, she said, you can, you can do it. Um, you know, and, and just kept me believing in myself, uh, even when it was hard, not hard to do that. Um, wow. And, you know, think I, I'm inspired every day now by women around me, women like you, Wendy, women, you know, that I work with in the FOP that are leading, you know, I have a, a lady on my committee, um, Olita Davis from Iowa, and she's the state president of the FOP legislature. She created the FOP in Iowa when there really wasn't any. And she's um, blazing a trail in Iowa when it comes to working on behalf of law enforcement officers. And so, you know, those kinds of things, uh, I, you know, if you open your eyes and look around, there are so many women doing so many great things that you could really look to and just be, you know, in awe of um, because, there were times when we maybe couldn't have done these things and um, we've really come a long way. So, yay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know what? I got to meet Olita in Nashville yeah, she's and she great. is, yes, she is. And, and so I guess that's a good, a good time to kind of transition then and talk a little bit about, um, I want to talk about Nashville specifically, but I want to talk about what you're doing. I hear your dogs in the background. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Crazy kids. <laughs> Well, I have a Weimariner that my husband's trying to keep under wraps upstairs. So it's all good because it doesn't always work. Um, but, but yeah, so you obviously talked about, you know, how you got into the role that you're in now and kudos to you seriously, because you are doing amazing work and I'm very excited about, uh, everyone getting to hear the things that you're working on. You, you touched upon it, but let's start in Nashville because then we'll kind of work our way back. So this, just a, couple, a month or so ago, gosh, it seems like it was such a long time ago, but um, I think it was only, was it your second or third national FOP wellness conference? This, this one was the third. Um, okay. So, yeah. So I'll tell you kind of how that, and I'll back up. We'll talk some more about people that inspire you. I, I've been very lucky um, as an FOP leader to um, be inspired and mentored by some very strong leaders along the way. So, um, you know, I mentioned that I've been in the FOP since sometime in the 90s, but I've been in various leadership roles in the FOP, whether it's on the local level, state level, through those years. And uh, one of the people who mentored me was past president of the organization, Chuck Canterbury. He was from South Carolina. And so he took this girl who moved to South Carolina under his wing and taught her more about the FOP and taught her about, you know, how the organization worked, uh, more about what it stood for and really inspired me to get uh, more involved in it and, and the things that I was doing. So, um, but also the current leadership of the organization is 100% behind the work of the officer wellness committee. And so that's a blessing to have, um, to, to be able to have the support of those leaders who understand our vision and understand, um, you know, where we want to go and, um, helping us to get there. So, uh, the, the wellness summit started as an idea, um, probably about six or seven years ago with the previous F national administration, the FOP and the, the past vice president, national vice president, Jay McDonald from Ohio said, you know, I think it would be cool one day if we, we have another training that we have annually. It's a leadership training to train FOP leaders. He said, I think it would be cool if we had like a training session, sort of like leadership matters, but it's just geared toward wellness. And I said, man, that's an awesome idea. Yeah. And so, you know, here we are, years later and that plan has come to fruition and it's so exciting. Yeah, it was, it was such a good experience. Um, you know, obviously I traveled there along with four other people from the agency that I'm, I'm working as a wellness coordinator at. And what was really awesome for me is, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. I had the, uh, pleasure and really great luck of getting paired with you as a subject matter expert for a federal program. So I got to know you and know about some of the things you'd been doing, uh, over the past year and a half, which I feel so lucky to have, have had that relationship and now friendship with you. But, and I knew about all these great things and it helped inspired and really inform and shape our program, um, at Cedric County Sheriff's office. But the other people that, that were there, they knew a little bit, but then for them to get to witness it and experience it themselves, like that was so awesome oh, because cool. 
to come and be there is a much different experience than for somebody to come back and tell you, hey, this is what the FOP is doing. Not to say that it's not important. It's still been really important because I've told you this before, that 2016 NBC survey that you just mentioned, I use that all the time to this day when I teach because one of the first things that I was tasked with in my role as a wellness coordinator is to implement a peer support team. Mm -hmm. And that, all of the, that survey, that research, the, the results of that are like, hey, this is why we started with this because this is what people find the most helpful. So all of those things that you guys are doing are really, I just want you to make sure you know that all of that research is much appreciated, at least for me, because it's helpful to back it up and say, this is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, but what you guys did there, oh my gosh, and if you wouldn't mind um, hitting on maybe some of the highlights, you had so many good speakers, you had some great <laughs> keynote speakers, breakout sessions, and I'll chime in too, but if you could tell those who are listening who don't know anything about it, why they might want to consider coming next year, like the kind of people that they get an opportunity to, to hear from. Oh yeah, awesome. So first of all, thank you for that feedback it's great to hear you know i don't often see everything that goes on uh at the summit because we're so busy making sure that it goes sure shortly. yeah um, but i i've heard so many things in the past couple of weeks about relationships people who finally were able to connect after seeing each other virtually or you know seeing each other on social media and never actually meeting people face to face so that's so awesome for me to hear that um yeah, so uh, we were very fortunate this year. We had such a great panel of speakers and presenters at the summit, beginning with the, the father, basically, of Officer Wellness, Officer Dr. Kevin Gilmartin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, who, who talked with us about our physical health. Uh, he and he and Chief uh, Pat Flannelly of Ohio and Kevin Brack, a uh, sergeant from um, another agency, gave a great presentation about, you know, physical health and the things that we should be paying attention to and the connection to hypervigilance. And, you know, because what we try to do at the summit is not just focus on mental health. Uh, for us, wellness is holistic, you know, so we look at financial wellness and we look at partner and family wellness. Um, well, we have, we present opportunities to engage in physical activity while there. There's, there's yoga. Uh, yep. <laughs> Wendy, dear Wendy Hummel, our yoga instructor, <laughs> whose class was very popular. Um, I was thrilled to see that. And, you know, so we all, we do an organized run and walk in the morning for people who maybe think they aren't into yoga and anybody's ever tried yoga kind of likes it. So, you know, or loves it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, but for, for those who think they aren't into yoga, we organize a run um, so that if people want to go run or walk, they can do that. And it's self-paced. Um, and so, you know, we try to offer something for everybody. We had um, seminars on burnout, on compassion fatigue, on, you know, helping military who were turning to civilian life in your agency on, um, wow, I'm trying to remember all the things. We had so many. I think there were something like, oh, 15 different choices you could go to. And then another thing that we do is we try to bring in subject matter experts to talk about these things. So we had a couple of panel discussions um, for one of those we brought in some police psychologists that we work with on a regular basis, Dr. Tom Coughlin, uh, Dr. Liz Schlosser, and Jennifer Myers from the Educational Development Center to talk about how agencies can support officers through crisis, whether that crisis is a critical incident, a personal crisis, um, you know, an other job crisis that they might be going through, things that agency heads, administrations, and other officers can do to support their officers when they're going through something, you know, from the perspective of, and, and Dr. Coughlin has spent a career as a police officer in New York City, um, retired as a detective, and, and now works in private practice as a treating psychologist for law enforcement officers. Dr. Schlosser does um, pre-employment, you know, across the country. So it's these are these are people who know a lot about the subject matter. And we try to change the, or we do actually change the agenda every year to make the cop the topics current. Um, we are we also, you know, so. It's meant we, we try to gear the content toward someone who's just starting out building a wellness program all the way to people who've been working in a wellness program in their agency for years um, so that we hope that everybody who comes learns something new. Uh, make some new connections. We had a, a good presentation from Indianapolis Metro Police Department, one of the oldest and best uh, wellness programs in the country. 
they they brought their whole team to talk about how they set up their program. Um, and we look, you know, we're we're already planning for 2023. Uh, actually, had a couple conversations today with our staff about uh, 2023. So we're excited, and you know, I, it gets bigger every year. This is only the third, and we've seen attendance grow every year, and I hope that that continues. Oh, and I, I'm pretty sure it will, based on what I saw. It was it was such a good, it wasn't just a good time, and I don't mean it to say it was fun, but the thing is, like, you know, you, you what you just said, you, you really did meet your goal, because you said you wanted to have it be geared towards people who are just starting a wellness program, all the way to people who are, have done it for a little bit, and I think I'm somewhere in between there, and so what's nice is, you know, you can pick and choose, and I found a lot of value. Like I really, I'm going to tell you a couple of my favorite sessions. So I went and saw the peer support couple. And what I really liked about that was they are people that I have been following on social media and I really like their message. I really like the fact that, um, they talk about family wellness because that's something we're really trying to incorporate into our program. I absolutely adore Dr. Salfati, who I know is helping you with your, <laughs> with, with some of the things you're doing. And so those are two things that really stood out, but I have to say, I think my most favorite part of really any kind of conference, but this one in particular is I still feel like this wellness space is small, it's growing and to be able to collaborate, cross collaborate and talk to and meet people that are doing the same thing in other places. And, and this is kind of a success story for those who are listening, who are looking to maybe start a wellness program and need to know where to start. Um, the way that I met you, Sherry, was through that CryTech program. And that's, um, I always butcher it, but Collaborative Reform Initiative Technical Assistance. What's the last C? Center. Perfect. You got Thank it. You. <laughs> okay. I always forget the C. So, um, and what's so cool about it is that it's just an application you felt through the, the COPS office. And they assign you a subject matter expert or a few in this case, depending on the area that you're looking to, to get help in. And for us, obviously, it was a wellness program. So I was matched with you and the guys from the Nashville Police Department. And so over the course of a year, you guys talked to me, I don't know what, every two weeks, you help give me guidance, information. We do peer exchanges, meaning I visited Nashville. They came to, to Wichita. But what was so cool, you talked about Indianapolis being at the conference, is that they really help propel like the growth of our wellness program. And it's really going places uh, a lot further and faster than I think it may have if we didn't um, awesome. become part of CryTech. But what was cool is we went to that presentation where Indi Indianapolis talked about their program. And then David from Nashville came and I got to see him and then some other people from my agency. And it was so cool because they were able to influence Nashville. Nashville was able to influence us. And it's just like this ripple effect. Like if we just kind of all work together and we have that open line of communication, this is something that we can really continue. So I thought that was probably my favorite part was to be able to see how all of those connections kind of came into be and um, just continuing all of that. And I'll tell you, Wendy, you say that, and and uh, I agree. And, you know, I, as you said that, it kind of resonated with me, is that that's actually how I'm uh, thinking, thinking about the FOP itself. That's what I have loved about the organization all these years, that I've, you know, I, I get, to, like, really kind of, like, uh, passionate about it sometimes when I, like, over-passionate people, like, Jesus, wow, you really love the FOP. But, you know, I saw at national meetings and national conferences – police officers from all over the country mm -hmm. come together and, and work together to accomplish things for the profession. And so, you know, I guess that uh, in putting together the summit, I, I'm kind of of the same frame of mind. Mm -hmm. People really enjoy getting together to work on the same things together that they're inspired by. And, you know, I think we, we're fortunate in that people that come to the wellness summit are inspired to create things within the wellness space, whether it's for their agency, for their region, you know, for their state, what have you, uh, or even for just themselves. And, you know, I think, I, I hope that we create an environment where people get even more enthusiastic about wellness when they leave um, and they take things back home and spread that word because, you know, part of our mission in the Division of Wellness Services is, is to, and I say this all the time, to keep wellness part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I say that at every single FOP meeting I go to, 
every single conference I go to, no matter whose conference it is, we have to keep talking about wellness because the more we talk about it, the more it's part of life. Um, it's something that we practice every day and not something that we where we just check a box and go, okay, yeah, I've done my wellness or yeah, I've set up a wellness program. It needs to be part of everyday life. And I think that's, you hit the nail on the head because a lot of people don't understand that. I don't think, I mean, I think the people that that are, that are going to the, to the summit and that are working on this, understand it and get it. And once it was framed and with the, with the help of you and the Nashville guys, like, Hey, this is something that if you widen the lens just a little bit, this isn't just about, okay, here's a program to do this, this, and this, this will help with morale. This will help with longevity. This will help with retention. And you're creating this kind of cultural evolution. You're changing the ethos of the way things have been for so long. And it really needs to be embedded into every part of your organization. And then just kind of kind of making sure people get that mindset. It's it's not easy, but once you get it and it clicks, it's like, well, yeah, it makes so much sense. This, this has to be a part of everything we do. Yeah. Healthy cops make healthy communities, period. I mean, you can't have Boom. a healthy community without healthy cops. So absolutely. exactly. Yeah. And, and I'm with you though. I get pretty passionate about and inspired when I'm around people. Like I got really jazzed when I was there because, um, you know, I know this might come as a shock, but sometimes the law enforcement community can be a little negative <laughs> and a little toxic, right? And a little like, you know, sucking like your energy sometimes. And, but when you're around people that are, this is their focus, it's not like that at all. No, it's people it's coming together who want to make a difference, who want to overlook all of the things, not overlook like, you know, it's all unicorn and rainbows and there's no problems in the world, but focusing on a better way. So that's that's, that's what was so, to me, that's was like a very important takeaway from awesome. the summit. Awesome. It's about being positive, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of the things I wanted, if you could speak to, so you guys are really big on doing research and yeah. supporting all the programs that you decide to put in place with evidence and a lot of, actually, you spent a lot of time doing that, which is, like I said, I love that because I'm kind of a research geek myself, but I think it's important though, when you're trying to present, especially to command staff, or to my sheriff, or even to the agency, like, this is why we're doing it. This is what the national FOP has found from research across the nation and beyond. So you gave a kind of a, a presentation, uh, one of the days I can't remember about some recent survey results. Would you mind speaking to that? A Absolutely. Little? So, um, that's kind of the academic in me as well is doing the research piece, you know, because I know that it's uh, easier for people to accept things or, or, you know, the powers that be to accept things when there's evidence to back things up. And so, you know, historically, there hasn't been a lot of research done with law enforcement officers. You know, like when I was writing papers back in school, you would go and look for research about officer wellness, officer mental health, and there was really nothing out there. Fortunately, that's changing. And so, you know, if you think about how can you get police officers, how can you, you know, get some research and evidence on the state of officer wellness, um, well, it's gonna, it's not going to be an easy thing to get police officers sub to submit to research. Um, but what we learned from the research we did back in 2018 is that if it's anonymous and you can, uh, you know, ask about things that law enforcement is interested in talking about, uh, which is how we knew that they wanted to talk about mental health, then you're going to get participation from people. Um, and so, you know, and then it, we, we are able to create a, a picture of a bigger voice of law enforcement. The more people that, you know, participate in the surveys that we do, the bigger voice we have. And we're fortunate that we, uh, the 2021 FOP Critical Issues in Policing Survey that we wrapped up this summer, um, nearly 6,000 police officers from every state in this country participated in that survey. And so, you know, when we talk about the results of that survey, we're not just talking about the Southeast or what cops are dealing with in the Midwest. We're talking about, you know, universally the entire country, what we're seeing in the survey results. And, you know, we talked about uh, during that presentation, we talked about stress and the sources of stress for law enforcement. We compared, you know, we traditionally look at critical incidents as the source of stress. Like we blame the critical incidents, right? We go, oh, we have PTSD in the profession because of the critical incidents. But 
We, we in the FOP believe that often we overlook the other sources of stress. Like those of us who have been in law enforcement for a while know what those other sources of stress are. Uh, yes. And, you know, what I often say is that, yes, I've been involved in critical incidents in my career. I've seen a lot of really awful things, as most of us who spend any time on the job have. But those were not the most stressful experiences in my career. The most stressful experiences in my career were going through promotional process or disciplinary uh, action, things like that. And so, you know, but we overlook how much those things stress out police officers. We overlook how staff shortages stress out police officers. And so what we were able to do with this research is we were able to compare the ratings of stress from things across those three realms, you know, whether it's job related as in, as in the work of doing, being a police officer, uh, including critical incidents, whether it's organizational, which is things like, you know, red tape created by your agency or, you know, uh, manpower shortages or things like that. And operational stresses like fatigue, um, not being able to spend time with family because, you know, you are overworked, things like that. And what we found is that the number one stressor for police officers is not a critical incident. It's not critical incident related. It's manpower shortages. Mm. And so things like that are very important for us to be able to talk about what we do to help police officers stay well. So if we're focusing all of our attention on critical incidents, well, yes, we have to recognize the impact of them. Uh, we, we cannot neglect the other sources of stress that might cause uh, officers to not be well. Um, things like not being having the feeling like they don't have the time to take care of themselves to work out. Um, so there's lots of really interesting information that's going to come out of that survey in the next couple of months. The presentation that we gave at the Wellness Summit, we had just started to dig into the data from the survey. Um, but there are so many things that we're going to be able to talk about over the next year or two. Um, to talk about what's really affecting law enforcement. You know, what's critical to law enforcement? I think the highest rated issue out of like 20 that we presented in the survey was um, loss of qualified immunity. Police officers are very worried about that in certain parts of the country, especially, um, you know, the rise in violent crime was another big concern for law enforcement as far as what they think is critical within a profession right now. And, and that's, it's cool that we're going to be able to talk about those things a uh, large scale. And then our plan is to do a survey uh, every two years and so that we can track things over time. We can track, we can contract, sorry, we can track over time um, how many officers are reporting that they have a PTSD diagnosis. We can track over time how helpful officers think peer support is, how much they're using it, um, you know, or what services they're using or not using so that we can scale back some that aren't being used and build up some that are, are being used to make sure that we're meeting the needs of what we're being told through our research that officers really need and want. So yeah, that's exciting stuff. I love that research too. <laughs> well, it's good to be in the presence of somebody who is excited and, and is a research person because you know, I, I got a master's degree in criminal justice in like 1996, like a long time ago. And uh, I remember doing research and I couldn't find a lot. So when you just said that, I, ha I forgot. I mean, this is back in the days when like things were way different when you were trying to do research. It was much more challenging. Yeah. But you're right. There was nothing really available specific to law enforcement. And I think it's so exciting that there's so much more that that is that is coming to the surface because that's what you need, like you said, to be able to go and say, hey, this is why we need to do it. I mean, even on like a smaller scale level, I've started to, to present statistics since we've had a wellness program for a couple of years now and say, hey, these are all the people that are using peer support. This is what they're finding valuable. Here's why we need to continue to grow it. And even like we have a really good EAP. We've got some culturally competent clinicians, right. which I, I, hear, I hear is unique. And they've started to track usage from our um, just the sheriff's office so that we can say, hey, more people are using it. But also like, you know, not you don't know who's using it, but you do know like the main reported issue. Is it a critical incident or is it something else? And so that all is so helpful because you can say, listen, people are using this first of all, but here's what they're using it for. And that's even on our level guiding the kinds of things that we're trying to focus on next. Yeah. So, so all of what you're doing is, is so important. And I know that you said that some of your research has kind of guided the program, uh, the programs that you're now focusing on. And 
One of the ones that I'm really excited about because I'm a huge positive psychology geek is your Power and Peers. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Yes, Power and Peers is a new curriculum in law enforcement peer support. And um, we are writing the curriculum in cooperation with the COPS office arm of the Department of Justice. So, uh, and kind of where that came from is when we did that first survey way back when, uh, one of the things we learned is that even in a, so back then, that was 2018, 17, somewhere in there, a lot of agencies didn't have peer support programs set up yet. Um, you know, pretty much everybody had EAP. Um, so we asked about how much those services were being used, and um, we found that for the people who had, had had peer support available to them, something like 90% said it was helpful to them, whereas ratings of EAP, critical incident stress debriefings, and those other things were not even close to that. And so we said, all right, well, we, the FOP, need to figure out what's best practices for peer support. We need to you know, make sure that we're guiding things and so we started looking around and there were lots of peer support trainings out there but nothing standardized um you know in a national standard and so we thought well you know if we're going to train our members to be effective peer supporters we need to all be speaking the same language uh and so we set out to write a, a standardized training curriculum in peer support the department of justice uh, got behind us and so we're putting that curriculum together now we hope that it will be piloted sometime in the summer um, it has to go through a series of processes um, through the Department of Justice to get through all the vetting and whatnot. But to talk a little bit about the curriculum and what makes it different from things that are out there is that there's a huge psychology, positive psychology component built into the curriculum where we're not just going to be focusing on critical incidents and supporting peers. We're going to be talking about everyday things, and we're not going to be focusing so much on what's wrong. Um, but getting that member or that officer restored uh, back to a place of equilibrium so that, that they can then use their strengths to build resilience, to, you know, grow from the struggles that they're having instead of looking backward. And so it's going to be a little bit different, you know, instead of, you know, thinking about it in a way where we're fixing what's broken, we're going to think about it in a way that we're building up strengths to you know, to build resilient skills that or will be there permanently and last every day. So yeah, very exciting stuff. Yeah, that's amazing because because you're right. And I think I've, I've mentioned this to you before and I swear it's my mission to, I love connecting people, like people that I think need to know each other and meet each other. And I think I've told you that I've been very fortunate here in Kansas to be connected to, she's the KBI wellness coordinator. Her name is Angie Jones. She has been doing peer support in Kansas for like 15 years. And she's similar to you. She's a cop, but she was a clinician and then became a cop. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so she's been doing this stuff and now she's, this is a full-time position for her, but they have created it like a week long basic peer support training. And we, you know, that's the, the training that we go through at our agency that has been funded by a grant, which is great. But the idea is very similar to what you just said is it so everyone in Kansas has the same training. We're all on the same page. We can support each other, which I just think is so brilliant. And the training is so top notch. It's, it's, it gives me chills when I see, I get kind of excited about this stuff too. But what I love about what, you know, I heard in Nashville and what I hear from you now about positive psychology is this is different. This is different training and it's, it's only going to supplement for the people yep. that do peer support and add just a different layer or element. And I, and, cause I think that's one of the things that I have found in the past that's missing is, okay, you're on the peer support team. You're on the SISM team. Here's some training and then you're done. No, we need to treat our people that are on these teams, like a high performing team, like yeah. constantly trained, constantly supported. So so I am personally very excited to see your curriculum. Awesome. I'm excited <laughs> that you're excited. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm a, yeah. I think we're like like that. Similarly, <laughs> we're geeks about that kind of stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. So as we wrap up, because we're kind of rounding in like on, on an hour, I want to make sure that we hit everything that people need to know about all the great things that the National FOP is doing. Um, so is there anything that I didn't ask you or that you think people need yeah, to hear? Yeah, there's one, okay. there's another project that we're doing. Um, so we, one of the other things that we found out again from the, the survey research is that one of the, so stigma has been a big thing, right? Um, the, the survey way back when said that 90 some percent of officers believe there was a stigma against asking for help. And one of the sources of stigma, which we also asked about, was that 
officers fear that a clinician won't understand the nature of their job and their work. And so we thought, all right, we need to find clinicians who are what we call culturally competent in the business, those that have worked with law enforcement or first responders, those that have, those that have been first responders or law enforcement, so that we can identify for our members who those clinicians and those services are, so that to cut out some of that work and to cut out the chance that they'll end up with a clinician who maybe doesn't understand their work and it shuts them down from using services in the future. So we are, uh, our committee, I have a committee of eight that works with me in the FOP, um, and they all have backgrounds in critical incident stress management or um, crisis intervention. And so the committee and I work together to vet wellness products, programs, services um, for, for law enforcement. And so we're talking about everything from individual clinicians to inpatient treatment programs to wellness training programs to wellness products like phone apps um, that are geared toward law enforcement to make sure that they are something that we feel comfortable recommending to a law enforcement officer or agency. And it kind of evolved, this project. We, we're in the process of developing this nationwide directory of services now. It should be online at its completion. Um, and we'll just continue to add to it as we continue to vet. But we've established a standardized vetting criteria for the services that we vet. And it's, it was co-published by the COPS office. It's out there. If you Google FOP wellness vetting guide, it'll pop right up for you in Google. And it lays out kind of all the things that we look at. It's a very in-depth vetting process that we use uh, to make sure that we're finding the best of the best for our officers. So that's, that's the other, I think, big thing that we are really proud of. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought it up because I completely forgot to ask you about that. Because <laughs> that was one of the things I remember you shared when we were working together. Like, hey, this is something that we're working on. And it's kind of funny because at the same time on the state level, we were talking about the same thing. Because in all my spare time, I was vetting people before, you know, before the anything was like established. Like, yeah. just to see, hey, if, if we can't go see these people at the EAP who are culturally competent, um, who can I recommend? Cause I'm, I'm one of those people that I will not send you somewhere unless I know for myself that, that I'm confident that this person will be a good fit. Now there's not always a hundred percent guarantee. Sure. So, um, so that's actually really important. And we, you know, your, that guide is comp so comprehensive, so helpful. So if anybody is listening, uh, they should check it out and I'll make sure that I add that into the show notes also. But one thing I'm, I mean, it sounds like that's a lot of work too, because I, <laughs> I know how hard it is for me locally to be like, Hey, I'm going to go to this pro. I mean, there's a couple of programs I can speak to because you know, in the Kansas city, Wichita area and therapists, but you've got to do that all over the country. And some of those programs are like a week long. Yeah. Yeah. Right? We, uh, we, we, <laughs> thankfully I have eight great people that help me, but yeah, it is a time consuming process, especially um, as thorough as we are with vetting. However, it's something that we feel like is worth it. It's worth it that we take our time. It's worth it that we do it right. Um, you know, all of these things that we're doing, um, some of them took us longer than we had originally planned. And we know, but we, and we know that people are out there waiting for the curriculum to be done and, and waiting to get the power and peer trading and waiting for us to develop this nationwide directory. But, you know, I would say that it's very important to us to make sure that we do all of it right and to do it the Absolutely. best way that we can. So, um, you know, if we look down the road a little ways, bear with us a little bit longer, you know, great things. And then more, um, the, the folks on my committee come up with new ideas every day of things that we can do to build. And so it's just going to continue. Well, and for anyone listening who wants to check all this stuff out, you guys have a website, yep. right? www.fop.net and look right under the wellness tab and it's all right there. Okay. Now, I don't know the answer to this myself, so this is partially why I'm asking. Is there anything on social media for FOP, or is it just website? Yeah, so if you are, uh, we do have social media on all of the major platforms, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, you should use Google National Fraternal Order with Police, and a lot of our content you'll see is uh, legislative in nature. It's got to do with the things that we're doing legislatively, but we do post wellness things there if you are an FOP member. Uh, if you're listening and you have not signed up to get the email blast, go to the website, sign up for the email blast and find the app. The FOP has a phone app that members can use and all of this wellness content is in there and more. Um, we also vet hotlines. The hotline information is within the FOP app. Um, so, you know, there's there's lots of 
great services right at your fingertips, both on the website and in the app. You know, whether it's um, articles about wellness topics, those things are also can be found in our app and on our website. So good stuff. Excellent. Well, Sherry, you are, wow, you're a trailblazer. You're a rock star. Keep up the good work. We, we need this. And thank you so much for, for everything that you're doing. Uh, you bet, Wendy. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Yes, it's been awesome. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Sherry. For more information on anything that we discussed, you can check out the National FOP website and hit the wellness tab for resources or upcoming programs that they are working on. If you would like to give us a review or send me an email at wendy at bluelineyoga.com for any comments or questions or any recommendations for future guests or topics that you'd like to hear more about, I appreciate and welcome the feedback. Take care. Down the